Ready to level up your career? Text DISH to 44043 now to dive into a world of exciting technician opportunities at DISH. From cutting-edge technology to a supportive work environment, DISH offers the perfect platform for your success. Connect with us today to discover how you can be part of a dynamic team driving innovation. Connect today and join the DISH family, where innovation meets opportunity. Text DISH to 44043 to kickstart your journey towards a rewarding career. This episode is brought to you by Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi-weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them, not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it is completely free. So join today at www.bonsai.film. It takes just a few seconds. And once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter on Friday morning. It's that simple. Go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights, our bi-weekly newsletter, and join a network of film creatives just like yourself. And don't worry, we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails, just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need. And if you ever tire of Indie Insights, simply unsubscribe. No gimmicks, no games. So go to www.bonsai.film to get Indie Insights for free. Listening to Make It, a podcast by Bonsai Creative that helps creatives in film get where they're going faster by sharing the advice, knowledge, and insights of professional creatives across the film industry. I'm your host, Chris Barkley, and with me today is my good friend and Make It podcast co host, Nicholas Bugs. Hello, hello, Chris here with another episode of the Make It Podcast, and this is an Indie Talk week, and that means I have not Nicholas Bugs, but actor, writer, and comedian Jessica Anderson here with me. <laughs> Jessica, say hello. 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 I'm so glad to have you here uh, guest hosting while uh, my good buddy Nick is under the weather. We, we wish him well. Yeah, I'm so sorry he's feeling ill, and I am grateful that you're having me on here. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. Um, I don't know uh, what's what's wrong with Nick. I think that he has an allergy to me. I think that's what, like, every, you know, whenever he has to be on the phone with me, he kind of gets a little bit under the weather. <laughs> For what I, I kind of get it. Like, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then if he has enough woo saws, then suddenly he has the energy to, you know, to, to converse with me. But you, <laughs> you have, you keep the energy. You're good to go. So like, I'm, I'm feeling good about this. Oh, well, good. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to, I, I think just for the audience to contextualize why I might have you on, as a guest host on Indie Talk, can you kind of give the audience a deeper sense of uh, who you are and why you're here? Well, it's, you know, I was thinking about this uh, earlier today. I was like, Chris and I have such like a funny like map of knowledge of each other and friendship. And it's like, it's uh, oriented online mostly. Um, <laughs> I've, I've always sort of uh, appreciated the power uh, and, and scale of the internet. And, you know, for me and you, I think it was just me seeking out creative people that were around me in the vicinity and people that other people were sort of like um, sort of tagging, like the algorithm does so much work for you. So they'll say, Jessica Anderson liked this too. And mm -hmm. then I would find out 
okay, Jessica Anderson likes Yeba. She likes Jacob Collier. She <laughs> likes. <laughs> uh, so I just kind of like was like, who is this person that likes all the same shit I like? <laughs> I love that. I love that. No one's yeah. ever mentioned those two like to me about me. I love that. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like the um, it's like the algorithm kind of gives you away, and I'm I'm always worried about that too. Like I have no, you never know what notification a social media network or an application is sending to the other party. Oh yeah. I mean, I've which, been doing Which this. is kind of messed up. It's all messed up. I mean, I don't, I have no idea like the, ex, like how expansive all that is. I could never articulate it. I have known, I have so little knowledge, but I know it's happening. You know, like we all know it's happening. There is so little coincidence on the internet anymore. It's like, you know, and I feel like there was like a three year period or something. I don't, I'm like an arbitrary number, but it's like where they, where we were like, oh, my phone has been listening to me. It's like, or, or, or like, isn't it weird that like this popped up when we were talking about that? And then like overnight it turned into, oh no, it's listening to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's oh, actively yeah, we've accepted. involved. Yeah. It so we're like, going to talk about stuff tonight and that's going to be all the notifications we get as soon as we open up oh the app on our phone. I know. I know. I don't even know like how to make it stop doing that. People know in the world, I've not met them. I don't it's know who they super are. obscure too. Like sometimes I will hop on Twitter and I'll go, they have a section like for you and then they have a section called trending. So one's trending just for you, things you're interested in that they think you're interested in or that Twitter thinks you're interested in. And then one is trending. And on the for you page, you can mention something so obscure and mm-hmm. it shows up and you're like, there are actually... 11,200 people in the globe tweeting about this. How, yeah. how is I mean, this it's possible? Like, yeah. And then if you don't, if you're not careful, it will become your identity. Like, yeah, I now know all these like really in, like intricate, like eyeliner designs. And I'm like, why the fuck do I need to know <laughs> that? You know what I mean? <laughs> do you, <laughs> why do, you, do, I, do you ever try to trick it? Oh, all the time. I'm like, I'll like something. And then I'll be like, I want more of that stuff. And then it'll pop up and I'm like, great. I actually, like, I don't actually want to see that. That's not entertaining to me, but educationally, like I need to know these things, you know, yeah. because if I keep liking like stupid, like, like I'm saying, if I keep liking stupid skincare videos, it's like, that's all I'm going to get. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now you're in I the, don't... now you're in the skincare vacuum. Well, sometimes yeah, I'll sucks. just put in really obscure things that I'm not interested in just so that, you know, that, a profile is built on me that's completely inaccurate. Like, mm-hmm. tell, tell me if you think this is psychopathic or not. I don't like to give my actual birthday in forms on the web. Do you do that too? Or do you always give your correct birthday? I'm trying to think of in what capacity you mean. Do you mean like when you sign up for like Instagram, when they ask for your birthday and stuff like that? Any, yeah. Anything that asks for your birthday, like it could be Facebook, it could be IG, it could be like any type of service or form. Like if it's not government and maybe even if it is government a little bit, I just like, why do you need to know my birthday and birth year? I don't think that's psychopathic. I think that's probably very smart and like very like um, you're like taking into account all of the things that could be used for that. But like for me, mm-hmm. um, I'm like, I had a pretty, I have a pretty, um, I wouldn't say it's a shitty birthday. But it's like, also, can I cuss on this thing? I'm so sorry. I've just been. Sure. We're, we're all adults here. Okay, great, great, great. Um, yeah. But it's like, um, I've my birthday is April Fool's Day. And so it's like, growing up, it's like, they say Friday the 13th is the most unlucky day of the year. And I would propose April 1st to be the most unlucky day of the year. Because people just, they do things and they think it's like, oh, well, I'll make a joke. And it's actually like a high risk, like death scenario. You know what I mean? Oh, and, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and so like, anytime I give the internet my birthday, I'm like, well, you know what, Snapchat, you can send me a stupid video on my birthday. I don't care. I'll take it. <laughs> you know, let's lighten this day up a little bit. Yeah. Cause you let's might put, you might put four like, one, but there's no reason to put four one in the year. Like, that's true. A, like a great way to trick social media is just to make it always think you're 17 or 18. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. I bet. Well, and it's like, why would like, yeah, if you could have a bunch of different accounts where you just like change the age, like you'd get so many different things and 
you kind of, you might be able to see into like the eyes of like different people in a way, you know, like yeah, what they're getting ex- exposed to. That's my point. When the app yeah. thinks that you're 18 instead of 38, maybe it opens the world up to you in a different way. Yeah. I mean, but like, if you, I don't even know why I'm like trying to like make like this a thing where it's like, if I had a million accounts where I'm like 17 or like a 65 year old man or whatever, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. don't you have to, don't you have to be active on it for it to like give you stuff or you know what I mean? Yeah, You like, can be active on it, but like, look, changing your age isn't just for old pervs. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah it can be for true. us too. We can democratize this to we our advantage also. <laughs> It's not, it's not just, it's not just for some old creeper to, you know, look at pictures we, on the internet. We too can be deceptive to the yeah, internet. <laughs> yeah. Cause you always hear those stories about those old guys, like 75 year old guys who are make 13 year old girl profiles. Oh, heard of it. I've lived it. I, I have experienced that. <laughs> I mean, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's not. I'll funny. break them down, man. I'll make them tell the truth. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not. Funny. It, it's funny, but not yeah. funny. It's it's funny because I survived it. You know what I mean? Like you get out of it, yeah. and you're just like, whoa, who the fuck let me on the internet when I was that age? You know, like wow. That's when it came out. It was like the Wild West. We didn't know what was happening. Yeah, I don't 13, think thirteen-year-old Jessica sitting in the other room on these stupid chats, and I'm just like, "What's that mean?" You know, just like crazy stuff. And I'm See like, what I mean? "We just didn't I, know." I don't envy parents in the next. Like, I'm very pro kid, but I don't envy the playbook parents will have to play by over the next twenty years. Mm. There's aren't there like parental guides on stuff. Isn't that a thing? I just don't even know. Yeah, but you know what happens is the it's the group think. You know, if if you have a kid that's in middle school or even younger now, and every one of their friends have Snapchat, you now have to weigh saying no because it's better for them, or saying yes. And so if you say no, you put them in social peril at school. Mm -hmm. Right. And you risk them being ostracized, odd man out kind of thing. If you say yes, I've never heard of it. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) You you risk them being sexualized and scandalized. So it's like, what do you like? What do you, you almost have to have like a coalition of parents who all agree no Snapchat for like no social media. I don't want to just like, I don't want to dog Snapchat alone, but it's because it's it's everybody. But anyway, do you want to mention just a couple of things you've been in recently? Because I know you did some theater and you've done web series. You've done a bunch of stuff. So I just want to make sure people can find stuff you've done and like verify why I think you're so great. Oh, thank you. Um, Sure. Okay. so. I think uh, the most recent projects I've been a part of, lucky enough to be a part of, uh, my friend PJ Brown, he's a director. Um, Over the years, I've worked with him on music videos, uh, specifically for Kit Moore and Maddie Poppy. Those are both musicians. And um, he wrote a feature. It was his first feature. And um, he, it was an indie feature. And he um, had a bunch of people from Nashville kind of get together. He lives in Charleston, but he had a bunch of people in 2021 get together and make this movie in 10 days. And he's been... um, you know, showing it to a few small groups in Charleston where he's at and, and he's just really proud of it. And I'm, uh, really proud to be a part of it with him and with all the people in it that I really love. Um, I just finished up, I guess it was a a couple months ago. Now I finished up a production. It's the, it was the U S premiere of the theatrical production of the Welkin by Lucy Mm -hmm. Kirkwood. Um, it is a phenomenal play. I would recommend anybody just read it um, the Welkin, it means the heavens. Mm, um, did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a, that was a pretty indescribable experience. Um, but I finished up that. Um, and then, um, I recently was on an episode as a co-star, uh, for this series on NBC called Young Rock. Um, I got a quick little role as a, uh, I don't really know what take they're going to pick. So it'll determine how desperate she is, but she's pretty sad in a couple of those takes. So 
Uh, she's just a sad little waitress that is doing her best to just make conversation at times. Um, so I've got that. that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that that group of people that I got to work with some local actors, some Nashville actors, some LA, they some shoot that in Memphis, right? They did. Yeah. And, uh, I think they were there all season for this season. I don't know. I think the first season was in Australia. I don't know about the second, but the third one, it's been at Memphis. So that was a great experience. Um, and then I'm currently working on a short film by my friend, Tori Mills. Uh, she's directing it and she's written it. Um, and I am so grateful to be a part of that. We're also having, you know, I get a, to be a part of my community that are friends that some people I've worked with and some people I haven't, and we all get to get together and we're going to shoot this film in December. So, um, big kudos to Tori. She's phenomenal. So I'm excited to do that. Wow. Yeah. Even more on the plate than I expected. That's pretty, that's pretty great. And this, this week has been pretty great. I feel like we've been blessed this week with a lot of really interesting content. Um, Mm -hmm. Not necessarily indie film content, although there's a lot of that as well. But I think the two things that really stuck out to me was the Neil Brennan blocks stand up. I'm so glad he reminded me of it because I see him on my feed all the time and I just like Sometimes things get pushed back, but I'm so glad you reminded me to watch it. And I did. And I'm, I'm just grateful for it because it was really wonderful. It's so good. He's so smart and he's such a good writer and, and it's different. I mean, it's, it's almost intentionally theatrical, like a one man show, almost like what Mike Tyson was trying to do a few years back mm-hmm. or did do, I should say, I don't want him to come over here and knock my ass out. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm a fan of Mike Tyson anyway. I, that would be sad if he did that. Um, and my only recourse would be to bite his ear off or something like that. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but uh, we also got the Dave Chappelle monologue. And this was like an extended monologue. And unfortunately, SNL is in a place right now where they're just then, you know, the skits just aren't, I don't know why some of the comedy pieces are so misaligned with what we think is funny today, but it's just, and I don't want to sound like a, you know, get off my porch guy, but like, it just was better in previous casts, you know, years gone by. So now it's like the weekend update, the musical performances and the monologue. And I thought the monologue made because it was 15 minutes long made this sort of an iconic episode that will live throughout history. And, you know, immediately the feedback I got in my little circle was that, Oh, that was awesome. You know, that was classic day. It was fantastic. It was great. And then I hop on social and Twitter specifically. And I start to see like these little people taking jabs at the monologue. Mm. And it just feels very, disingenuous like i feel like if dave gave that monologue 15 years ago it would have been you know let's let's nominate this monologue for emmy and it still might win an emmy just but it feels like here the the, the funny thing about the juxtaposition is neil co-wrote the Chappelle show and there are people dogging dave for bringing back um, his Chappelle show characters in the SNL episode. It's like, wait, Neil co wrote that, right? Like those are half his characters too, in a way. Mm-hmm. Right. And, but you're praising him. Uh, Reggie Watts in particular, um, him and Lon Harris jumped out at me, Reggie Watts. I'm going to read this tweet from Reggie Watts. Cause that's to me, it like encapsulates everything. He writes, damn Dave Chappelle. I hope you consider a different approach to your current social commentary. It's feeling joyless and lacking the enlightenment you used to inspire. I understand the idea of crossing the line, but there are many more subversive yet unifying ways to do so. So I read that and I was just like, 
was was Neil Brennan stand up joyless? At times it was. It's reflective. It actually ends sad, hopeful, but sad. Like it's a morose piece in general. Yeah. But no one's giving it that critique because they realize that's who Neil is and that's what he's done. And that was the point. Mm -hmm. But they're acting like Dave can't be joyless if there's no joy to be had for him in this. If, um, if it was meant to be, you know, um, if it was meant to be addressed with a certain tone and I just, uh, I just find it false and you're, and look, you're welcome to disagree with me on this. And as a comedian, I know, I know you might have a position on it, but I, yeah. I just, I thought it was weird. No, I, I, I appreciate you uh, talking about it and telling me how you feel and, you know, um, and I like, listen, I'm not, I'm not chilling with, you know, Dave or Neil or, um, you know, when Neil has that joke in a special about that group of people that he encounters at the, you know, party or whatever. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but I'm not in that circle, in that circle, you know, I don't do stand up too much anymore, but like I have spent a lot of time, you know, doing it in the past and research and all this stuff, but I don't ever pretend to know on a celebrity level, what those people are going through and, and to know, like, listen, I think, well, I think what Dave did in that monologue, there's one sentence specifically that he found a way in a sentence to unite everyone. Mm. And I like had to stop listening to it. Cause I was like, Oh, he made everyone the same just for a second. And I don't think it like, I don't think it like raised everybody up to this place. I don't think he like brought everybody down. I think it was just right there in the middle and everybody was right there together. Um, what Neil, you know, like I'm white. And so my, my relationship with Neil, um, I might actually be able to relate to what he's going through more so because he is also white. Um, And like, so I don't pretend, I also don't pretend to know completely like where Dave's coming from whenever he does these things, because the craft like that he brings to it, he honors that experience through his craft, which I think is so respectful. Um, and him just like, and hit, but it's like, it's like both Dave and his work and Neil and his work both bring me to tears. So it's like, why is that? Why for me, it's like, I don't think one is ever above the other. Cause yeah. just as well as like they have their own unique experience and I understand, I have my own unique response, but it's, I can't, I can't say that like, well, one was much more important than the other or whatever, yeah. but, what's, but what's, also, wrong with, what's wrong with celebrating both of them. Totally. Like, what's, what's wrong with saying that both these things were awesome and we got them both in the same week. Yeah. Like, and I, I, like what's wrong. I, I don't understand what's and I, it just makes me realize that I think, you know, Dave's on the other side of an issue for some people Mm -hmm. and it's still killing season for him. Like there are still like people who want to take their little shot and see if they get away with it and see like where the temperature of the listening audience is through, through comments and through replies, like, okay, are they with me? Are they against me? Cause I don't, I'm with you. Like, I don't know how, if you're Lon Harris, who, who I respect and like, and I've liked some of the stuff he uh, he's put out, or if you're Reggie Watts, like what part of it's not unified? Like, how do you say not unifying? I, I get maybe some of the joyless part, even though even I got tired of him slapping the microphone and like laughing at his own joke so much, mm-hmm. like, which is what Chappelle does. Mm-hmm. And if it weren't him and it were anybody else, people would be so pissed at that. Right. Mm-hmm. But he does it in a way that's like, cool. So even I, don't like that. So I don't mind him not laughing at his jokes that much in this monologue. The, the line that stood out to me where I thought this is something only Dave Chappelle can do is when he says, I live in Ohio with the poor whites. Mm -hmm. And so how much pressure must he have on him where the, the benchmark and the line for people to enjoy it or not enjoy it, is that he's forced to make you feel joy and enlighten you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, imagine being on stage and that's like your bar. 
Like yeah. anything below enlightenment for your audience is a fail. Yeah. No, and that's what he that's said. Crazy. I think that's how I are that's how I interpreted what he was saying about like, I'm tired of talking to you like this. Yeah. Like that's that's what I interpreted from that was like, what a fucking load to carry. Like, and that's fucked up. Like oh, that's a great point. You know, and I, I didn't and think I, about that. Uh, yeah, and maybe that's the, maybe that's not the maybe that's not what he intended. I just I love that's that. What I, took. I, I think that's right, Jess. But I just feel like you know, I you know, like he he is a magnificent comedian, and I and I'm sure he's a magnificent community member. I just I cannot imagine that load like that he's got to take on in this way. And I and I guess I just sensed that in the monologue was just like. I'm sure he's fucking tired of that. Like, that's a lot. And that, I mean, like, I just, you know, I, listen, I really, really like Reggie Watts. I love Me Reggie too. Watts. Love Reggie Watts. And he has just been like, um, when I first discovered him, I was like, oh, well, this is what I want to do. Like, I don't know how to fucking play instruments or anything like that, but I was just like the joy at <laughs> which that he, he um, ignites in people in this way that's like, tantalizing and like goofy and like you feel like you're I've always felt like listening to him at times I'm like oh I'm transported back to like childhood where I don't like I don't care the way that I laugh or I don't care like why it makes me laugh it's just like if I feel high almost sometimes after mm-hmm. watching his um inter like uh, medium pieces yeah. and what like being a part like that being a part of me it's like but also like I, you know, I follow Reggie on Instagram and I listen to a lot of what he has to say on there. And I really, really value what he has to say. Also, again, he's one person, you know, with a ton of experiences like everybody else, but it's like, I guess what I hear whenever you read that tweet, cause I'm not on Twitter. I don't follow any of that. So I don't totally know what everybody's got to say as far as their opinion. I I've, I've dodged it somehow. Maybe I'm being ignorant or, or avoidant. I don't know, but it just hasn't happened. Um, but it's like Reggie, I think, I think that there's been this thing in comedy, uh, as like, a it's like fallen over everything where it's like, it's the balance between cynicism and, um, and, and joy and, and, and like igniting laughter. It's like some, like, there's always this level of cynicism that I think has to happen in comedy or it's just not doing things in a way that like makes you giggle, you know, it yeah, makes and, you laugh, makes you feel like, like lit up. And it felt like there's like a code amongst comedians, maybe I've always been wrong about this. You could tell me if I'm wrong or right about it, that like you guys just typically don't seem to shit on each other. Oh, I mean, like I, I wouldn't say that at all. I mean, not, um, not in public. I always thought that happened backstage. Oh no. I mean like, I, cause you're already ex- getting shit on by the audience at times. Oh, right? Yeah. No, I mean my experience, I've never been protected from that code. I would have liked to have been protected from that code, but I sure <laughs> never signed anything. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't, I've never experienced that necessarily, but I, I, I don't know. Listen again, I have, there are lifers uh, like of comedy of stand up specifically in my life that are my friends. And I will never pretend to know as much as they do in that realm. But I will say that like as an artist and uh, it's, I always think about like the places where these people live, these celebrities live. Yeah. And while I've only visited LA or New York or Ohio or any of those places, I just always like to remind myself of what their atmosphere is like every day. And that could be like, they have a certain, um, they live in a certain like income bracket or, or it doesn't necessarily have to be geographic. It's just like, where are these people living at all of the time? It is not too, uh, um, exclude their realities or like, or like, um, discount what they feel. It's just like, I always like to remind myself of that because I think there are universal things that people talk about in art. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're talking about with, with these two, with Neil's show and, and, um, Dave's monologue. But it's like, I always just like to remember, like, what would somebody that like has never had a voice say, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And not to compare it or make it better or worse, but it's always just like, I don't, and I don't know, uh, sorry, I feel like that's kind of like a tangent, but I just. We love tangents on the Make It Podcast. Okay, well, good, because I got yeah. plenty of them. Um, but I just like to remind myself that like people don't have 
I like to remind myself that there aren't like five people in celebrity form that like have all the answers or like, there's not one person, you know, Yeah. because I think it's like a community effort. And, um, I, I used to think that I think I used to, I think we all do like at a certain age, like whether it be musicians or, or other artists or, you know, writers or whatever, it's like, we always put them up on these pedestals in a way that like, I think actually gets us through really hard adolescent times for some of us and, and even into our twenties and things like that. And, and I think it pushes a lot of us, but it's like, there's no one has the, has all the answers or the entire experience. And so I think it's really hard to like hold people to a place where they should, where you're like, Oh, you should be leading people. It's like, no, I think you should, exactly. you know, it's like, you should be offering, I think resources if you have them available to you and also like you should understand that like that's um like I'm not saying like you know well if you have this much money then you should donate this much or anything like that it's just like I think that like I think the distribution of resources in our culture in general is really where the problem (laughs) lies in a lot of ways of how voices get heard and so um I just think it's like a reminder that like hey there's there are other voices that have a lot to say And also these ones have really great things to say too, that we get to hear. It's like, what a gift that you can have somebody that's like lives next door to you that might have something really important to say, even if you don't agree with it necessarily. Yeah. And and look to, to that extent, to that, like, uh, just mentioned that I love Lon Harris, love Reggie Watts, Mm -hmm. just disagree with them on this. And I don't have to say that, that, that those tweets were joyless and didn't enlighten me. I'm just saying I disagree with their take, but I, 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 but to your point, like, you know, when you're an entertainer and it's not enough for you to entertain. And the other fact that I just want to bring up before we move on, cause I'm sure we beat this to death, but it's like, <laughs> I hate when people fake a thing, you know, like when something is objectively good and then you gaslight us, to say, here's your take. So that you're sort of veering left intentionally while everyone else goes right. That just gets under my skin. Yeah. Neil Brennan's piece was objectively great. Dave Chappelle's monologue was objectively great. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want to, we're going to talk about that in another case coming up here in a little bit, but mm-hmm. I want to do something new. We have a new segment called Stuff You Don't Know About the Movie Business. And to do, <laughs> this is a terrible name. Uh, so we'll come up with like a better name for this segment. But I want to bring in producer Papa Bear. And here's how it works. Papa Bear, you're going to, hey, man. Hey. Yeah. You're going to give us, I guess, a question. And, and then me and Jess will try to guess the answer. And then you tell us if we're right or wrong along with the audience at the end of this conversation. Okay. So with that, take it away. You know, a lot of people are going to be flying, going to the airport. It's going to be slamming, but not everybody has to do that. There are at least 10 celebrities that can fly their own plane. Mm. So we know the common there's like three that everybody pretty much knows, like John Travolta's flying Damn, around. Took my guess away. Go ahead. And, yeah, and his seven twenty seven, mm-hmm. and then there's of course Tom Cruise, and everybody knows about Harrison Ford. He's had enough accidents. Um, <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. That's not on a lighter note, is it? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, can you guys think? of at least five to seven more or at least 10 celebrities that fly their own plane. They're not all film celebrities, but most of them are. So think of five to seven other people that fly their own plane. I have a question, Papa Bear. You're saying that they are actually actively the, the pilot. They have a license. To got it. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay, so so they they're the flyer. They're not just flying on it. They are the pilot. Oh wow. Okay. okay. So, so you have plenty of time to think of several. 
All right. Well, oh, I can Jess, barely just talk about something Jess, what at do you, once. I can't what, talk and think can, about other things. Papa Bear, before before you go away, Papa Bear, can can me and Jess combine? Like, if she gets three yeah. and I get two, um, does that count? Sure. Jess, what do you what do you think? I'm I'm going to say my initial guess was going to be Drake, but then Drake's just like on the plane, not. Um, not flying the plane. That's a good guess. Yeah, I thought so. Um, I want to say Antonio Banderas, and I don't know why. Oh God, Antonio Banderas. Okay, I'm gonna let's write down. Let's write this down. Okay, you've got Antonio Banderas. Yeah, which is so wrong as I say it, like as it comes out of my mouth. But hey, um, <laughs> okay. Are we supposed to be thinking of this as we talk about other stuff? Or are we gonna are we gonna brainstorm right now? Yeah, let's brainstorm this right yes. now. Let's just okay. get like let's get there's somebody in the audience that's laughing at us right now because the answer is so obvious. Yeah, they know. I don't know. And, they know. Uh so we and, he gave, know this, my and dad. he gave us he took away the ones that were obvious, like Harrison Ford and Travolta. But who's oh. like Travolta? Who does Travolta hang with? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton's not flying his own playing chess. Um, you don't think he got bored or something? No, nah, he gets people to fly him everywhere. Yeah, that's true. Um, it's a flex, though. It is a flex. Um, celebrity that flies their own plane. Oh, Jeff Bezos. Oh, yeah, that's good. I'm going to, you got Antonio Banderas. I'm going to go Jeff Bezos. Uh, the cowboy of the air. Richard Branson. Richard Branson. See, you're just getting all the ones I would know. I'm like Nicki Minaj. (laughs) (laughs) Please, for the love of God, Nicki Minaj. Are there any celebrity black pilots? Like, is Morris Chestnut flying a plane and we don't... (laughs) We don't know. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Is this list, like... (laughs) <laughs> well collected or is this just are we thinking of like the famous ones because there might be people low-key doing this but yeah it, but there but there is kind of like a the hint in it all is the money like if yeah for example if um uh if you have too little money just then you can't be flying your own plane right like you don't you're not flying your own jet around you're like going to like a, a like an airport and maybe you're taking flight lessons or oh yeah, no, like you I don't tried. have your own private jet that you're like flying around all the time. So I'm thinking like legacy superstar actor, like a Harrison Ford, like a John Travolta. And so I'm going to go with Sean Connery, Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt. Those are so the, okay. So I've got, I'm writing those you down. You already said Tom Cruise. no, he said John Travolta and Harrison Ford. And Tom Cruise. He said Tom Cruise. Did he? Yeah. I did. Oh, damn you, Papa Bear. <laughs> okay, I'm sticking with Sean what about, Connery. Um, Ron Howard. Oh, Ron Howard. Okay. Okay, we'll touch base with Papa Bear at the end of this conversation. But we're going to go with Antonio Banderas, Sean Connery, Jeff Bezos, Ron Howard, Richard Branson, Brad Pitt. They are flying their own planes. They have pilot license on a regular basis. Okay. Maybe add Tom Hanks later too, but maybe not. I don't yeah. know. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, Tom Hanks. Yep. We're, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, writing yeah. it down too. Okay. Okay. Boom. I, I like this list. I feel good about it, Jess. So I kind of teased this earlier that we were going to talk about this other issue and uh, I know that this is all about Wakanda forever. I know, <laughs> I know, I, I know, you, I know every, like we had, everyone's watched it. It did $180 million this weekend in the box office, mm-hmm. right? It was, it was the, um, it's the box office kind of like you hope to get when you spend a billion dollars on a movie, by the way. How much of that uh, budget for Black Panther was branding and marketing? Probably 60, 50, 60%. Mm-hmm. It felt like. 
And so this is what we talk about when we talk to independent filmmakers about making sure they have branding and marketing budgets. You want to use the same cameras as a studio filmmaker. You want to use the same editing software. So you're using Avid, you're using Reds and Aries to shoot on, but you don't have even one line item for branding and marketing. And you know that studio filmmakers are spending 35 to 60% of the entire production budget on p a it's like it 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 makes my makes my what's that mean? Your brain explode? Yeah, yeah. It makes my mind explode that we even have to evangelize that. Anyway, <laughs> sidebar. Everybody watched Black Panther. The reviews are coming in. It's like half the people are saying it's like the best movie of the year. The other half of the people are saying. This was nearly nearly three hours long, too long, and it was about belittling men. Hmm. And I want to, having not seen it yet, the one person around me that hasn't seen it, even though I had a screening on Wednesday for it and was completely boxed out by some woman who had a Wakanda party and bought up all the tickets, um, or used up all the seats, actually, uh, I'm going to the side of this is a really good movie. And the reason why is the other side feels like they have an agenda. Like, oh, this is about, you know, women, Jack. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if that metaphor goes, but the sure point does. Is, sure this does. Is, yeah, this is about women uh, feeling like, uh, like giving themselves a clap and, and they're going to util- uh, eulogize, you know, Chad Mc. Wig Bozeman, and they're gonna like uh they should have replaced Black Panther with like another Chadwick Bozeman instead, and it's a woman now. And there are guys that are frustrated. I'm like, ooh, you kind of like put your bias on Front Street right there. It's kind of like when people get freaked out because there's a black aerial. Oh my god. And it's like, uh, yeah, but what's wrong with the black like the like what's yeah, wrong with like it's all it, it's only it, yeah it's only <laughs> weird because the other aerial was white all right like if the movie just started with ariel being black are you saying the movie wouldn't be good anymore and it wouldn't be the classic that it is i don't know i don't it's weird you know may, maybe not so I, to me it feels like a bunch of incel guys a bunch of like involuntarily celibate dudes yeah. are like <laughs> <laughs> just another, just another punch to us in the nuts. Just another punch in the gut to us men out there that are working yes. hard every day. And and uh, working we get hard it. on Reddit. <laughs> yeah, on Reddit. Yeah, we we get it. Women are in charge. Like, what is up with you, bro? What is going yeah. on? There's 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 space for everybody. People talk about uh, liking like equality and like sort of balance. But in it's but in the practice of it, like it's very disjointing for people. It's like it's very upsetting to people when everybody kind of actually gets a chance, or like oh everything can be seen. It's like oh, I thought it, like in in principle you like that thing, and then in reality you don't. I had a friend that used to like um, chain smoke, but he didn't want anybody to know I was the only person that knew. So he would smoke Mm. and he would hide it. And then he would lecture my other buddy at the time, my roommate about how shitty and ashamed he should feel for giving in to smoking. He literally just spoke his inner monologue. That's what he just said to his friend. Yeah. Yeah. And like, people are really like that. Like, yeah, they are. It's so uh, crazy. Like, you know, NIMBY, do you know NIMBY? Like not, Mindy. not, not in my backyard. Oh no. Yeah. People are very, very nimby all the time. Like they want, they want like this piece of the world to be solved and to fix a thing, but not in my backyard. <laughs> like, like, don't do it. Don't do it to me. Like it doesn't apply to me or like, don't put that housing community in my neighborhood or, you know, however it might be. Mm-hmm. And and you can yeah. like across the board, there's like nimbyism that happens. So anyway, mm-hmm. I go to see 
Black Panther, congrats to Ryan Coogler and, and the whole team. 180 million is going to make a lot more money. That's huge. Mm-hmm. I go to watch it on Wednesday, Jess. Okay. I don't have a fucking seat. I don't, I can't sit down anywhere. And, oh, no. and you know, what really irritated me is I walked into an aisle where I thought there was an empty seat because there, it was empty. And the lady was like, Oh no, I'm saving this for someone. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, in my peripheral two two aisles up was this like chubby girl. I don't know why I said she was chubby, but she was. And, and I think it's cause she was rude to me. And she gave me like the, <laughs> she gave me like the, she swatted like the, like you like she away? dismissed me. She just was like, get your ass out the way. Like get your black ass out of the way. That's what she did. That's basically what that hand means is get your black ass out the way. Oh my That's God. What now, you know, uh, I don't mean that in a racial way. I just mean where I grew up, that hand means that. Uh-huh, so I was uh-huh. like, you don't have to just chill out. She was so she's, mad that she's going to miss the opening scene of the Wakanda. The Wakanda made people feel crazy. Like, like it's too much fervor. But I am glad. I'm happy for the movie. So anyway, my alternative at that point, once finding out I could not sit in this lady's safe seat and being swatted away by the uh, young lady two two rows up. So not knowing what to do, we went and watched Black Adam, which Mm -hmm. unfortunately had many open seats. (laughs) So, so, uh, you know, Black (laughs) Adam wanted to do the box office that Wakanda Forever did. And I'd been told that Black Adam was a bad movie, right? And I watched it, and in my opinion, it's not great. Mm -hmm. But... When we look at the reviews of it, I found something very, very interesting. And I've been really open about Metacritic being my favorite place to sort of look at reviews for movies because it aggregates and scores every professional review of a movie. Mm. So you can have, so I think Black Adam got something on the order of 50 professional reviews that span every newspaper and critic in the country, it feels like or even the yeah. world, and it gets a aggregate score. So its aggregate score is 41 out of a total possible score of 100. That's called like a mixed review movie. So anywhere between 40, I think, and 59 is considered a mixed review movie, or maybe 55. Yeah. So it gets like, so most people didn't like it. But what I don't understand is how the San Francisco Chronicle gave it a zero. Their review was absolutely scathing. Can I just read a piece of this review to you? Yes, please. This is going to blow your mind. This is a, this is a mind blower. So <laughs> the San Francisco Chronicle said, seriously, don't see Black Adam. Don't encourage this. I don't even want to admit that it's an actual movie, but assuming it is, it's the worst of the year and one of the worst I've ever seen. That's pretty brutal. And that was from Mick LaSalle from the San Francisco Chronicle. So making a movie is so hard in my experience that it is a bit demoralizing to get a, a review of zero, Mm -hmm. like zero feels unfair. Right. Because it's just so hard to actually I mean, make what it on earth. Yeah. Like, how can you even, mm-hmm. how can you even give that score? Right. So, no doubt. All that aside, it's a zero. Mm-hmm. That's what Mick LaSalle thinks. That's what's going on. So, we go to the top of the critic reviews. And this is from RogerEbert.com. I loved Roger Ebert when he was alive. I loved Gene Siskel when he was alive. I like both of those folks. Okay, so I respect Roger Ebert. He comes from the Chicago Sun-Times, I believe. Uh, If I'm wrong about that, someone correct me and tell me he's from the other Chicago newspaper. But here's (laughs) here's what Matt Zoller cites, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, said from RogerEbert.com. They gave the movie an 88. Like, I don't know if Schindler's List got an 88. (laughs) (laughs) This, This is directed by... 
Yame Colette Serra, I hope I pronounced the first name correctly, and featuring a remarkable lead performance by Dwayne Johnson, the spiky and majestic Black Adam is one of the best DC superhero films to date. Now, how is this possible? Uh, How can there be an 88 from RogerEber.com and a zero from the San Francisco Chronicle? I used to work with this. I used to work for this doctor. I don't think this is going to apply necessarily. I'm going to say it anyway. I used to work (laughs) for this doctor for a few years and he was a, he was a good dude. And, um, he said one time he was like, you know what, Jessica, you, whenever you graduate from medical school, there's, there's people at the top of the class and there are people at the bottom of the class. Like there are, there are A's to C's getting sent out. Like, it's not like everybody's fucking passed and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it's like, I think of that, like what I was saying earlier, it's like, you know, you gotta really, you gotta like evaluate the source, you know, and then you gotta scan it through your own microcosm of experience and be like, what did I think? You know, it's like, holy shit, I have an opinion. It's like all of these like critics. I don't know. I just like, I don't get into it in a way that like, it's like, it's like, I love academia. I think it's like a super, um, I loved being a like at, in a university, like in college, mm-hmm. you know, Ditto. but, but I really, I didn't enjoy paying for it, but, um, <laughs> like I love being in it and I love learning from people that were like, you know, they knew so much about what they do, but I think it's also about understanding that like you're, you're learning from someone that not always, but often you're learning from somebody that is teaching the thing, not making the thing. Yeah. So, and so That's it's like, and so it's like with critics, I think it's funny. Cause it's like, you're, you're, and I, I'm not saying every critic is like that, but it's like, you're like, it's like, it's like saying somebody that's like eating a lot of fucking spaghetti, but it's like, <laughs> but it's like, they never have made spaghetti. And it's like, well, I like it. Well, it's like, yeah, well, you know, if you put a shit ton of sugar in your spaghetti, it's going to taste good. But it's like, like, is it, is there integrity in it making it that <laughs> way just because it tastes good? You know? It's like, I don't even know what I'm saying. I just think that it's like important to like <laughs> experience it yourself. I don't know. I just like, I think that that stuff is so silly and it's, but it's also like, it's like a, it's like news in a way too. So it's like, they got to get like some sort of attention of being like zero. And it's yeah, like, well, well, did they put it on your resume? Like they put the spaghetti eating on the, on the resume. It's like a Jessica Anderson. <laughs> uh, I've eaten 1200 plates of spaghetti. Yeah, or, or, I, or, or I once, I once ate spaghetti. I once ate spaghetti in in Naples. <laughs> yeah, and let me tell you, whenever McDonald's was doing spaghetti for like a season there in the summer of 1996, best spaghetti I've ever had. Wow, like, I didn't cool even know beer. that. I'm gonna have to Google I that to it. verify. I'm gonna have I to trust for verify on that. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's spaghetti would be the most suspect thing of all time. Yeah, unless yeah, it terrible. like never happens again, and then no one can fucking verify it, and then yeah. like <laughs> you know, yeah. and Naples is always second. Well, but here's the thing, and here's where it gets a little weird. And this, okay, so I feel what you're saying, and to a degree, like a large degree, I, I really identify with it because as a filmmaker, it, we don't want to admit that reviews matter, but they really do. Like we hate it. Like oh, we don't care what the reviews say. We're not here, for, you know, to you know, appease everyone, you know, the, the, you know, the whole line, the indie filmmaker producer line, you know, there's a line we say, and it's a defense mechanism. Let's just face it. Because the truth is, is there's so much competition for what to watch that people will lean on reviews to figure out, should they watch this? And so the truth of the matter is, is that reviews actually matter quite a bit. Like you really need, you know, your movie to be reviewed well. And so I, I just don't think any movie is a zero, but here's the thing. I don't think Black Adam was a good movie. Mm -hmm. I don't. And so I'm actually looking at this backwards where it's like, was RogerEbert.com paid for this? And if not, they are literally guilty of what Reggie Watts and Lon Harris were guilty of, which is, (laughs) which is like being divergent for the sake of being it, like being uh, divisive for the sake of it in the sense of like, Okay, everyone's panning Black Adam. We're going to tell you it's the best movie ever made. 
we're going to tell you it's The Rock's Dwayne Johnson's best performance of all time. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, just isn't. Well, and I think that, like, that's, see, I, I don't totally, like, care about, listen, I'm never, I've never been in a place, like, in my life, career-wise, where I, like, you know, I mean, I mean, maybe, I know that there have been local outlets to review things that I've been a part of, but it's, like, I just, I, I know this sound might sound naive and I, I don't mean to sound dismissive of it. It's like, but I just don't care about reviews because reviews to me are different than opinions of like people, like actual people, because right. like you're saying, but you're doing the indie of, film thing right now, Jess. Totally. I think, I think it's like, there's like a, there's like a lack of trust though, to me. And like within outlets, sometimes it's mm-hmm. like, like you're saying, it's like, well, what, like, again, what's the source? What are, what's their initiative? What do they, you know, like what's their whatever. And like, they just have a bigger voice because of A, B and C resources. And it's like, yeah, I have, I am a naive indie filmmaker and I am like, (laughs) okay with like being at a place in my life where I'm like, I just want to make my friends laugh. And I just want the people in my life to be inspired what I make by what I make. And Cause I was thinking I was watching, I don't, this might seem like a thought that everybody has ever had, but like, it was kind of, it was remarkable to me and new, but it was like, I was watching, um, this film. It's a feature called after sun. It's one word. Um, yeah, yeah. and it's, yeah, it's a director. It's written and directed by Charlotte Wells. Um, she's a, she's in America now, but she's a, a she's from Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember sitting in that theater and it, it's been at the Belcourt theater here in Nashville for a little while now, I think. But, um, I, I was sitting there in the theater and there were like, I don't know, like 15 people in this really beautiful theater, like this, uh, uh, and I was just like, I was like, it, it moved me so much. I mean, I had to like, I was driving home and I had to sit, take a minute where I was like, it just like, I just, it was just coming out. Like the tears were just falling out of my face. And oh, wow. I just I remember it thinking, incredible. it really, I mean, I truly, I don't know if everybody had the same response and listen, like <laughs> not all of us have healthy relationships with our dads. Okay. But, right. um, <laughs> I, I, you know, so I'm, I might be biased, but it's like, um, I think that having, that having had that experience, having sat in that theater, I know that that filmmaker knows that that movie is in that theater right now. I know that. But the fact that I remember thinking Charlotte Wells is probably either in her apartment, having, having a meeting with somebody, talking at PR, just walking around in, like, in New York or wherever she's at. She's doing something right now, and she has no idea how little people are in here, how many people are in here. Net, what you what every single person is thinking she just she's just moving on like she's just doing her life yeah and i and i for me that realization was just so beautiful because i was like oh i like what what people think is so important and i and, and i'm not naive i understand from a resources perspective you need to have good reviews and you want those things but it's yeah. like shit if you're pleasing everybody like i don't I don't want that. Like, I don't want to be a part of things like that. And I don't want people to have me like, I just don't think that that I don't, I think that like, that's also, I don't know. I think that's also what, like, not to get on a big fucking tangent about Marvel. Cause I don't honestly know enough about it to like, know. but it's like, I think that that's like the sticky thing about it. Right. Is that it pleased people so much for so long. And now it's doing this thing where it's like not pleasing people anymore. And people yeah. are like, pissed off or surprised and and I could I mean I I could only theorize because truly my lack of knowledge about Marvel I should not even be saying these words but it's like that I just I don't as far as like what people think I thought about that I was like this movie meant so much to me and this filmmaker isn't even thinking about that right now probably not because they don't care but because they got work to do like there's always work to be done and if you're doing I think if you're making things even if people, even if they're like big blockbuster shit, it's like, you know what? There's a team of union people on that set that like are fucking working their asses off. And like, I just think about that every time. I don't know. Maybe I'm being avoidant about the actual problem or whatever, if there is one, but I just like, <laughs> I always try to like, be like, <laughs> you're like, Jessica, shut up. Like, you don't know what you're talking about, but it's like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, no. Like, like my pushback to you is that 
I don't yeah. think we should care about what people think. I, I agree with you on that. Like that is yeah. to me, that's yes. But we it's not about what people think. We care about what yeah. critics think, like what one person, yeah. like one important person in film thinks. Because we have created a world where the person that doesn't do but knows the history has a perched position of power in the industry to drive revenue. Yeah. And, but I think so that's yeah. the whole thing. Yeah. Like ask a playwright if, if they want a good write up in the, in the New York times, like they sure. do, like they do. It's true. And if they don't get one, their play freaking fails. Yeah. Which is like, which is also something that I'm like, and I, I, th I think like maybe what I maybe misspoke about was like, as far as like, I think Charlotte Wells actually probably cares a whole lot what people think, but mm. I mean, not, I don't mean to like put this all on like her, but it's like, if I were her, I would totally care what people thought when they saw it. But like in that very moment, I cannot think about all the places that this movie is being seen in the way that it's being perceived. Like, right. I just can't like, it's your, your brain can't do it. And so I think sometimes with like reviews, I understand like, that my limited knowledge of how that controls like the resources that you get now and in the future and like how people see your work is so important. I've never been on a level where that's like ever been a conversation. Um, but it's like a part of me is like the, it, putting people up on a pedestal, like we were talking about earlier of like what they like them being like gatekeeping is like such a reality and also something that can be debilitating if you give it too much power yeah, um, I, I see what you're putting. Yeah. Cause I feel that way too. Like once you've done the work, once you've put it out there at that point, you have to decide just for self-preservation that you're not going to read or listen to anything mm -hmm. because it's done. You it's did done. the work it's out there yeah. and you can't spend your mental energy trying to assess what every single person thinks about it. It's like that little piece I put on social media of me singing glimpse of us by Joji, by the way, yeah. controversial statement, Joji album greater than Drake and 21 Savages album, <laughs> right? Drake and 21 Savage are just talking shit again on another album. Nothing meaningful there whatsoever. Donda is still the best rap album to come out in the last two years. I'm going all the way, push your T it's almost dry for the Grammy win, by the way, in hip hop. But <laughs> I, once I decided, once you gave me the internet muscles to like in bravery to put that out, then I just did oh. it. And yeah. I haven't looked back at it. Like I, like I liked your comment and then I, and like, I think maybe cookie McCray's and that just like moved on. Cause I don't, oh. at this point, I'm just going to do the next thing. Right. Like, so I get that part of it, but what I really hate is I think that RogerEbert.com's review was false and look and like not false because it's wrong, but false because on like on purpose, like gaslighting us. Yeah. Like they're yeah. driving revenue. They're driving revenues to black Adam and people are not going to see an 88 film. Yeah. Yeah. That's what frustrates me the, the most. And Look, uh, full transparency. There's a game that gets played. When you make a film, you call your friends that are movie critics and you ask them to write you a favorable review. Instead of going to unknown critics, because why? The first thing I'm going to ask you is to send them a screener. And what a producer doesn't want to do is send a screener into the wild and not know what that person's going to write about your movie because you are teetering on a margin that's so slim that if you get a couple of bad reviews due to your screener, right? It's all your fault if you made a bad movie, but you're teetering on this place where it's like, okay, if, if they write a bad review, we're not going to make any money. No one's going to watch this at all. They're going to like bypass it. It's too competitive. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be a hypocrite because that stuff does happen. But in the major studio world, I think just writing, like Brandon Hirsch said it best. He's an actor, friend of the podcast. He said, not all money is good money. And if Roger oh Ebert.com. What a fucking mouthful. Not, yeah, not accusing them. But if they did, or if any critic takes money to write a review, they should have a disclaimer. 
Oh, they yeah. could say this was a paid review, like even in the small print somewhere, because they have so much power, they're going to drive revenue to the film. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. let's yeah. bring let's bring Papa Bear back in. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Where did that go? Um, All right, we have a very solid list of potential answers for you. And every time I say one that's right, I want you to say ding, ding, ding. Okay. Oh, boy. Okay. The silence is going to be deafening. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Antonio Banderas. Okay. Jeff Bezos. N- n- okay. Richard uh, let me Branson. Give, let, me give my, let me give my own disclaimer. Okay. I have my list. And it's not exhaustive of the world's celebrities. So it could be, I'll have to research it, but as a celebrity, he is not listed. Mm. How's that? Okay. Why would he why would he bother with such trivial tasks? He has a he penis-shaped rocket. Yeah, he's a cowboy. Right. Yeah, but he doesn't drive it. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. It's his <laughs> penis though. He molded it after his own junk. Yeah. Uh, well, no, no, it was molded after his head. <laughs> okay well i always say like his logos always his products always look like a phallic symbol right like that amazon arrow yeah. that's just a curvy penis and then the rocket is just kind of a stubby penis right yeah. everything bezos makes is penis shaped there's something there think about it what about spacex spacex isn't owned by jeff bezos therefore they don't make their rockets penis shaped well it- Kind of got that shape. Well, it's a it's a, an obelisk could be a penis, but it's not. It doesn't have the ridges. This is what right, Bezos does. He puts the ridges yeah. on the obelisk. That when makes we were it, in uh, charge, we would have found out already. We will eventually find out that the vagina shape actually is the most aerodynamic. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that would be great. A vagina rocket. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to write that down. That's a good idea oh, for just. Sauce? Some, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to use vagina rocket in the future, but I am going to use it. So I'm writing that down. Okay, Sean Connery. Certainly a landing pad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you get a landing pad for Jeff Bezos's penis shaped <laughs> rocket. Yeah, this is perfect. Okay, that's my that's my twenties, Papa Bear. <laughs> <laughs> landing pet. Uh, <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. You know. Uh, okay, Sean Connery. No, no, but he did get third place in Mr. Universe in 1953. Damn, that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll win. We'll win a million dollars for answering that one day, Jess. Uh, Ron Howard. No. Wow, yeah. I believed in Ron Howard. Brad Pitt. Ding, ding, ding. <gasps> Bang, Biscuit. Tom Hanks. Oh, God. Oh. No? no? Okay, we got Brad Pitt. We got one of the five. What are the other four, PB? There, you did get close. There is the black pilot, Morgan Freeman. Oh. Damn it. I was going to say that. Like a Twinkie. Like a Twinkie. And, and along with Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie. Oh, of course, Angelina, my baby. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, who else? Clint Eastwood. Mm-hmm. Grandpa. Uh, Kurt, Kurt That can't Russell? be safe, by the way. He's, what is he, 97? Yeah. Kurt, Russell. Yeah. Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell. They're all up there, aren't they? Kurt Russell's underrated. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid seems like a he seems like a pilot guy. This is yes, we were like we were like adjacent in a lot of these. Yeah, we were like just left or just right of the correct answer. Yeah. Papa Bear, thank you. We appreciate it. And Jess, I appreciate you. This has been an absolute blast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I've had so much fun. I hope I'm just not like rambling the whole time. <laughs> we, I think we were both rambling, but uh, we had fun doing it. It was great. And um, I hope this audience enjoyed it too. Uh, and I hope you'll come back and do it with us one more time. Uh, can you tell everybody where they can kind of find you on social media, on the internet, see anything 
that you've done stuff like that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm on Instagram. Um, it's at gestation is my handle. It's J E S S T A T I O N. It's the best joke I've ever had. The only great joke I've ever had. (laughs) And, um, (laughs) and then I, uh, my buddy and I, Josh and Akalia, he's an extremely talented writer, comedian, actor. So wonderful. Um, he and I are, uh, we, we made this, uh, series uh, quite a few years ago now, but we have it online. It's called oil and martyr. So like oil, like, um, oil and water, but it's martyr as in marriage. So, Mm -hmm. um, so we have that series online at oilandmartyr.com and it's, it's a fun, it's, I'm very proud of that, even though it's a few years old now, but, um, if you want to check it out, you're more than welcome to check it out online. I've watched every episode and several of them <laughs> were directed by my good buddy and friend of the podcast, Ted Welch. And so Ted, oh man, shout out to Ted Welch. Yeah. Shout out to Teddy. He's been on the podcast twice and he did a mistake in the making recently that everyone should listen to. And if you want to know more about bonsai and the make it podcast, you can find us on social media at underscore bonsai creative. That's on Twitter. That's on Instagram, on TikTok and Facebook. You can just search for Bonsai Creative and we will come right up. Same thing with LinkedIn, by the way, if you happen to be on LinkedIn, like if you're a professional listening to this, you can also just go to bonsai.film. So www.bonsai.film to find out everything uh, from uh, our services to the podcast, what we do in branding and marketing, what we're doing in the philanthropic space with our fiscal sponsorship. And you can sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter Indie Insights, which uh, we have one of those dropping tomorrow. It's really easy. It's bonsai.film forward slash subscribe. You can also just find the newsletter on the website and sign up. Don't worry. It's free. We don't spam you. We don't sell your information. And it's easy to sort of unjoin or unsubscribe if it's not your jam. So we just want you to be happy and provide you with the resource. And uh, this week, since Nick isn't here, I will provide us with the credo. Be better. Be creative, be engaged. Thank you for listening. And Jess, I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Anytime. Had so much fun. Be good. Thank you. Bye. Hey, gang. One more thing before you go. I want to talk to you about Indie Insights. Indie Insights is our bi weekly newsletter and love note to the film industry, movies, and the creatives that make them. Not to mention you, our esteemed listeners. Inside, you'll find curated industry trends, articles, exclusive commentary, and underappreciated films from filmmakers like you worldwide. And the best part is that it's completely free. So, join today at www.bonsai.film. It just takes a few seconds, and once you sign up, you'll get the very next newsletter. It's that simple. Go to www bonsai.film to get indie insights our bi-weekly newsletter and join a network of film creatives like yourself and don't worry we'll never sell your information or spam you with a bunch of nonsense emails just the bi-weekly film industry goodness you need and if you ever tire of indie insights we hope not but if you do simply unsubscribe no gimmicks no games so one more time go to www.bonsai.film to get indie insights for free and thank you for listening <laughs>